Book Five, Canto Ten of the Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Canto Ten. Prince Arthur takes the enterprise for Belgi for to fight. Gerioneo's seneschal he slays in Belgi's right. Some clerks do doubt in their deviceful art whether this heavenly thing whereof I treat to eat in mercy be of justice part or drawn forth from her by divine entreat. This well I wot that sure she is as great and meriteth to have as high a place sith in the Almighty's everlasting seat she first was bred and born of heavenly race from thence poured down on men by influence of grace. For if that virtue be of so great might which from just verdict will for nothing start but to preserve inviolated right oft spills the principle to save the part, so much more then is that of power and art that seeks to save the subject of her skill, yet never doth from doom of right depart. As it is greater praise to save than spill, and better to reform than to cut off the ill. Who then can thee, Marcilla, throughly praise that herein dost all earthly princes pass? What heavenly muse shall thy great honor raise up to the skies whence first derived it was, and now on earth itself enlarged it has from that most brink of the Americ shore unto the margin of the Molochus? Those nations far thy justice do adore, but thine own people do thy mercy praise much more. Much more it praised was of those two knights, the noble prince and righteous Artegall, when they had seen and heard her doom a rights against Duessa, damned by them all, but by her tempered without grief or gall, till strong constraint did her thereto enforce, and yet even then ruing her wilful fall with more than needful natural remorse, and yielding the last honor to her wretched course during all which those knights continued there, both doing and receiving courtesies of that great lady, who with goodly cheer them entertained, fit for their dignities, approving daily to their noble eyes royal examples of her mercies rare, and worthy patterns of her clemencies, which till this day amongst many living are, who them to their posterities do still declare. Amongst the rest, which in that space befell, there came two springles of full tender years, far thence from foreign land where they did dwell, to seek for succor of her, and of her peers, with humble prayers and entreatful tears, sent by their mother, who a widow was, wrapped in great dolors, and in deadly fears, by a strong tyrant, who invaded has her land, and slain her children ruefully, alas. Her name was Belgi who in former age a lady of great worth and wealth had been, and mother of a fruitful heritage, even seventeen goodly sons, which who had seen in their first flower, before this fatal teen them overtook, and their fair blossoms blasted, more happy mother would her surely wean than famous Niobe, before she tasted Latona's children's wrath that all her issue wasted. But this fell tyrant, through his tortuous power, had left her now but five of all that brood. For twelve of them he did by times devour, and to his idol sacrifice their blood, whilst he of none was stopped nor withstood. For soothly he was one of matchless might, of horrible aspect and dreadful mood, and had three bodies in one waist and pight, and the arms and legs of three to succor him in fight. And sooth they say that he was born and bred of giant's race, the son of Gerion, he that while in Spain so sore was dread for his huge power and great oppression, which brought that land to his subjection through his three bodies' power in one combined. And he calls strangers in that region arriving to his kind for food assigned, the fairest kind alive, but of the fiercest kind. For they were all, they say, of purple hue, kept by a cowherd, hight Eurytion, a cruel carl, the which all strangers slew, ne day nor night did sleep to tend them on, but walked about them ever and anon with his two-headed dog that Orthrus hight, Orthrus begotten by great Typhion, and foul Echidna in the house of night, but Hercules them all did overcome in fight. His son was this, Gerioneo hight, 
who, after that his monstrous father fell under Alcides' club, straight took his flight from that sad land where he his sire did quell, and came to this where Belgi then did dwell and flourish in all wealth and happiness, being then new-made widow as befell after her noble husband's late decess, which gave beginning to her woe and wretchedness. Then this bold tyrant, of her widowhead taking advantage and her yet fresh woes, himself in service to her offered her to defend against all foreign foes that should their power against her right oppose whereof she glad now needing strong defence him entertained and did her champion chose which long he used with careful diligence the better to confirm her fearless confidence by means whereof she did at last commit all to his hands and gave him sovereign power to do whatever he thought good or fit which having got he gan forth from that hour to stir up strife and many a tragic stour giving her dearest children one by one unto a dreadful monster to devour and setting up an idol of his own the image of his monstrous parent gerion so tyrannizing and oppressing all the woeful widow had no means now left but unto gracious great Mercilla call for aid against that cruel tyrant's theft, ere all her children he from her had reft. Therefore these two, her eldest sons, she sent to seek for succor of this lady's geft, to whom their suit they humbly did present in the hearing of full many knights and ladies gent, amongst the which then fortunate to be the noble Briton prince with his brave peer, who when he none of all those knights did see hastily bent that enterprise to hear nor undertake the same for cowherd fear he stepped forth with courage bold and great admired of all the rest in presence there and humbly gan that mighty queen entreat to grant him that adventure for his former feat she gladly granted it then he straightway himself unto his journey gan prepare and all his armors ready dight that day that not the morrow next mote stay his fare. The morrow next appeared with purple hair, yet dropping fresh out of the Indian fount, and bringing light into the heavens fair, when he was ready to his steed to mount unto his way, which now was all his care and count. Then, taking humble leave of that great queen, who gave him royal gifts and riches rare, as tokens of her thankful mind beseen, and leaving Artegall to his own care, upon his voyage forth he gan to fare, with those two gentle youths which him did guide, and all his way before him still prepare. Nay, after him did Artegall abide, but on his first adventure forward forth did ride. It was not long till that the prince arrived within the land where dwelt that lady sad whereof that tyrant had her now deprived, and into moors and marshes banished had, out of the pleasant soil and cities glad, in which she went to harbor happily. But now his cruelty so sore she dread, that to those fens for fastness she did fly, and there herself did hide from his hard tyranny. There he her found in sorrow and dismay, all solitary without living white, for all her other children, through a fray, had hid themselves, or taken further flight. And eke herself, through sudden strange affright, when one in arms she saw, began to fly. But when her own two sons she had in sight, she gan take heart, and look up joyfully. For well she wist this night came succor to supply. And running unto them with greedy joys, fell straight about their necks as they did kneel, and bursting forth in tears, Ah, my sweet boys, said she, yet now I gin new life to feel, and feeble spirits that can faint and reel now rise again at this your joyous sight. Already seems that fortune's headlong wheel begins to turn, and sun to shine more bright than it was wont through comfort of this noble knight. Then turning unto him, and you, sir knight, said she, that taken have this toilsome pain for wretched woman miserable wight, may you in heaven immortal guerdon gain, for so great travel as you do sustain. 
for other mead may hope for none of me to whom naught else but bare life doth remain and that so wretched one as you do see is like our lingering death and loathed life to be much was he moved with her piteous plight and low dismounting from his lofty steed gan to recomfort her all that he might seeking to drive away deep-rooted dread with hope of help in that her greatest need so thence he wished her with him to wend unto some place where they mote rest and feed and she take comfort which god now did send good heart in evils doth the evils much amend i me said she and whether shall i go are not all places full of foreign powers my palaces possessed of my foe my cities sacked and their sky-threatening towers raced and made smooth fields now full of flowers only these marishes and miry bogs in which the fearful eufts do build their bowers yield me an hostry amongst the croaking frogs and harbor here in safety from those ravenous dogs nathless said he dear lady with me go some place shall us receive and harbor yield if not we will at force mogger your foe and purchase it to us with spear and shield and if all fail yet farewell open field the earth to all her creatures lodging lends with such his cheerful speeches he doth wield her mind so well that to his will she bends and binding up her locks and weeds forth with him wends they came unto a city far upland the which while on that lady's own had been but now by force extort out of her hand by her strong foe who had defaced clean her stately towers and buildings sunny sheen shut up her haven marred her merchants trade robbed her people that full rich had been and in her neck a castle huge had made the which did her command without needing persuade that castle was the strength of all that state until that state by strength was pulled down and that same city so now ruinate had been the key of all that kingdom's crown both goodly castle and both goodly town till that the offended heavens list to lower upon their bliss and baleful fortune frown when those gainst states and kingdoms do conjure who then can think their headlong ruin to recure but he had brought it now in servile bond and made it bear the yoke of inquisition striving long time in vain it to withstand yet glad at last to make most base submission and life and joy for any composition so now he hath new laws and orders new imposed on it with many a hard condition and forced it the honor that is due to god to do unto his idol most untrue to him he hath before this castle green built a fair chapel and an altar framed of costly ivory full rich beseen on which that cursed idol far proclaimed he hath set up and him his god hath named offering to him in sinful sacrifice the flesh of men to god's own likeness framed and pouring forth their blood in brutish wise that any iron eyes to see it would agrise and for more horror and more cruelty under that cursed idol's altar stone and hideous monster doth in darkness lie whose dreadful shape was never seen of none that lives on earth but unto those alone the which unto him sacrifice it be those he devours they say both flesh and bone what else they have is all the tyrant's fee so that no whit of them remaining one may see there eke he placed a strong garrison and set a seneschal of dreaded might that by his power oppressed every one and vanquished all venturous knights in fight to whom he once show all the shame he might after that them in battle he had won to which when now they gan approach in sight the lady counselled him that place to shun whereas so many knights had foully been fordone her fearful speeches naught he did regard but riding straight under the castle wall called it aloud under the watchful ward which there did wait willing them forth to call into the field their tyrant seneschal to whom when tidings thereof came he straight calls for his arms and arming him with all eftsoons forth pricked proudly in his might 
and gan with courage fierce address him to the fight they both encounter in the middle plain and their sharp spears do both together smite amid their shields with so huge might and main that seemed their souls they would have riven quite out of their breasts with furious despite yet could the seneschals no entrance find into the prince's shield where it impite so pure the metal was and well refined but shivered all about and scattered in the wind not so the princess but with restless force into his shield it ready passage found both through his habergeon and eke his course which tumbling down upon the senseless ground gave leave unto his ghost from thraldom bound to wander in the grisly shades of night there did the prince him leave in deadly swound and thence unto the castle marched right to see if entrance there as yet obtain he might but as he nigher drew, three knights he spied, all armed to point, issuing forth apace, which towards him with all their power did ride, and meeting him right in the middle race, did all their spears at once on him in chase, as three great culverings for battery bent, and leveled all against one certain place, do all at once their thunders rage forth rent, that makes the walls to stagger with astonishment so all at once they on the prince did thunder who from his saddle swarved not aside ne to their force gave way that was great wonder but like a bulwark firmly did abide rebutting him which in the midst did ride with so huge rigor that his mortal spear passed through his shield and pierced through either side that down he fell upon his mother dear and poured forth his wretched life in deadly drear whom when his other fellows saw they fled as fast as feet could carry them away and after them the prince as swiftly sped to be avenged of their unknightly play there whilst they entering the one did the other stay the hindmost in the gate he overhent and as he pressed in him there did slay his carcass tumbling on the threshold sent his groaning soul unto her place of punishment the other which was entered labored fast to spare the gate but that same lump of clay whose grudging ghost was thereout fled and passed right in the middest of the threshold lay that it the postern did from closing stay the whiles the prince hard pressed in between and entrance won straight the other fled away and ran into the hall where he did wean himself to save but he there slew him at the screen then all the rest which in that castle were seeing that sad example them before durst not abide but fled away for fear and them conveyed out at a postern door long sought the prince but when he found no more to pose against his power he forth issued unto that lady where he her had lore and her gan cheer with what she there had viewed and what she had not seen within unto her shewed who with right humble thanks him goodly greeting for so great prowess as he there had proved much greater than was ever in her weeting with great admirance inwardly was moved and honoured him with all that her behoved thenceforth into that castle he her led with her two sons right dear of her beloved where all that night themselves they cherished and from her baleful mind all care he banished End of Canto 10 Recording by Thomas Copeland